Booba's Dialogue. This is a one school for all lecture by me, Andrew Thomas, for my international students at Estefold University College to watch by Tuesday, the 26th of September 2023, when we will next be meeting. So last time we uh, got a reaction to the use of data in the classroom in the context of special needs education and assessment for learning from history. So we talked a little bit about perspectives, about seeing like a state and other ways of seeing. And today I think we're going to try and um, talk a little bit more about this other ways of seeing and other ways of engaging. And instead of going through the historical lens, we're going to go through a kind of existential mystical lens. Um, and, and that is who this guy is, Martin Buber. Um, um, it's going to be abstract philosophy, but already in this video, I'm going to try and take it back to the um, classroom floor and um, talk through some consequences for his thought for what we do um, as teachers and what, what other people do as teachers. Um, and just a note on the text, um, I find Martin Buber a dream to read. I, I find his prose wonderful, but that's because I read him in translation and maybe he had a great translator. My friends who, or previous students who had read him in German found him extremely frustrating. So you are entirely forgiven if you want to read him um, in English rather than go back to the original, um, if, that's, if that's what you want to do. So it's, it's your choice what language you read. He's a very established philosopher now, so you should actually find him available translated in, in many European languages. Let's talk a little bit about who Martin Buber was because um, because actually um, many of the nationalities in, the, in our classroom today um, should find some connection with him. He was born in Vienna, um, 1878, so it's a good while ago now. Um, but um, at the age of four, he moved to Lviv, uh, which is now in Ukraine. Um, and he actually grew up um, with his grandfather in sometimes in his grandfather's house some some of his childhood in his father's house um, his parents were divorced um, until he then um, went to university um, and he studied at the university of um, vienna um, but he he went to various universities so he was kind of like the best erasmus student ever um, so we've also got leipzig zurich um, actually, I'm not doing it in, in time here, but Berlin, um, various um, different places. And, um, and he actually eventually worked as a professor in Frankfurt. He was Jewish, and that's what everybody knows about uh, Martin Buber. Um, and he's famous for his, um, his views on the state of Israel. Um, and, um, and he really made a mark on the first half of the 20th century um, philosophy, but because of also other events of the first half of 20th century, um, he was not allowed to continue to work as a professor at the University of, uh, of Frankfurt. And he actually resigned in protest in 1933 anyway. Um, so it was a difficult time to, to live there being, um, being Jewish, but also being very outspoken. And Martin Buber had things to say to the world and wasn't afraid to say them. So eventually in 1937, he um, moved to the University of, um, of, of Jerusalem. And that is actually where he died in, in 1965. So, like I say, best Erasmus student ever, covering so many different European languages and um, European universities and um, different cultures. And I hope you also do the same, if not by traveling to them, at least by discussing with them and with each other, because Erasmus um, is a gift to the world and it is a great way um, of learning different uh, university traditions and academic traditions. So, well done for traveling, Mr. Buba. Um, the, the big idea in Martin Buber's philosophy um, is actually not primarily contained in the book that I put on the reading list, um, but the one that he's most famous for is, is in his famous book, I and Thou, or I and You. Um, so let me just try to explain it to you here. So imagine this cat is trash talking me, um, spending terrible rumors about you know, claiming that I don't really like Taylor Swift's work um, or saying that I'm a, I'm a nerd and don't have anything interesting to do in my spare time. But he's, he's, he's basically talking all about me. So I am, I am an object 
for um, for the cat. Um, the cat refers to me as him, that guy, um, with my proper name maybe, um, but um, but not as you because he's talking about me. He's talking about me behind my back. So. So like I say, I am, I am an object in the cat's world. So that's what we're talking about philosophically. We've all got a life world, a world view. And he's got a world view, um, including objects like, I don't know, um, mice and pieces of wool and fish. But he also has a, a world view about me. But imagine I then just show up. It's really awkward. Um, but suddenly the cat has to talk to me as a you. I'm a conversation partner. And we can still talk about things, you know, maybe we want to talk about fish, dogs, the demise of humanity through excessive use of lasagna. Um, who knows what we're talking about? But the point is, I am no longer a part of the cat's worldview at that point. I am a dialogue partner. When we talk about the world, we talk two people about the world. So it's a three part thing. Um, and when I am confronting the cat, then the cat can no longer really talk about me as an it, as a him, as a something out there. I can't be captured by that conversation. And then we together put a worldview together in, in an IU situation. But it's like we are the two viewers of the world and the world is the it. So Martin Buber says that there is an enormous difference between um, the way we use our language and our thought about the world, I refer to it, and the way we use our words and our language to each other, so you. The first one kind of constructs a worldview. The first one paints a picture about the world. It's a referring activity, um, it, him, that thing. And the, the second one, the IU, is actually a way of relating to other people. And we do so by sharing worldviews and things like that. They're not mutually exclusive activities. We do both of these things all the time. But my relationship to the things I'm describing is completely different from my relationship to you, to whom I'm talking. Because you, to whom I'm talking, are also somebody who can share my worldview or can help construct it. The point is we are portraying together. It's like we are both painters on a joint um, artistic project, um, but there's a massive difference between um, our relationship to each other and our relationship to the thing to which we speak. So for example, um, so I guess you could say in other ways, JK Rowling's relationship to me, her reader, is completely different from her relationship to Harry Potter. Um, I can imagine Harry Potter, she can imagine Harry Potter, Harry Potter can't imagine us. So, so this is the essential um, difference. There's a difference between it and you. Um, and the difference is philosophical, but it's also complete, a complete difference. You can't really cross that line very easily. Um, so I can always talk back. So um, we can we can always criticize, whereas the it can't really, uh, it doesn't have a say about how we think about the it. So that's the massive idea. <clears throat> and, um, and it has a consequence for us as teachers, because we are, uh, as we've already talked about in assessment for learning and in special needs education, we are making data, making descriptions of classrooms all the time. Um, when I ask, um, when I ask a pupil or a, another human being, what gender are you? Or are you happy? Um, or how much time do you spend on your homework? Um, I don't just do that as a way of relating to you. I also do that in order to find data. And that's what we've talked about with assessment for learning. We find out what people know in order to then plan our future lessons. Um, these are strategic factor that affect facts that are useful for us in the future. I then write that stuff down. I have a, a, a class list. Um, and whilst these questions might start as an IU, how are you feeling? Um, it ends up with a description of the person who's, uh, who's answering these questions. And I guess in Martin Buber's system, therefore, we would say that when, when we use classroom data um, in order to plan our lessons strategically, we turn people from a you into an it. And that is quite a provocative thing to say, and it seems like an innocent thing. And he's not saying that we are 
um, depersonalizing them necessarily or that we're planning their demise in any way. It's a charitable thing to do still. We still are trying to work for their, for their good. Um, it's just our relationship to them has completely changed by the fact of describing them. So yes, this is all very philosophical, but it has some really practical consequences, and we're going to talk about them maybe in class. We've talked about pupil data, um, but, to, but in classroom we also need to talk about relationships and what difference pupil data ha makes to our relationship. How can you be honest with pupils that you are at the same time describing to some theoretical, theoretical questionnaire in the sky? So let's you and I meet. Let's talk. Let's talk about us. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about relationships next week when we meet face to face in class.